Thank you. Sorry, I was waiting for the red light. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, it's about 3.35, and we call to session um, this joint session of the School Board and Town Council's Finance Committee meeting. Uh, for the record, we have present, um, as we have in uh, all of our meetings, uh, Christine Messingo, um, School Board Chair Donna Beely, School Board Finance Chair Chris Siazzo, Dr. Entwistle with the School Department, um, David Creech, um, our high school uh, principal, uh, school Finance, Kate Bolton, our Town Manager, Tom Hall, myself, Sean Babine, I also have Peter Hayes from the Town Council, and Bill Donovan, and we also have Ruth Porter, our Town Finance Director, and, um, see if I get this right, is it Jane? Jen. Jen. Jen, I'm sorry, Jen Lynn, Lim from our uh, Technology Group. Uh, with that, uh, just a quick introduction, we talked about setting an agenda today to cover really four areas. The first is to discuss investment and deployment of a technology resources that are a school system from K through 12. Uh, we're also going to be talking hopefully about developing a level services budget and identifying cost drivers. And then the third is really appointment of a subcommittee or at least to provide some update because uh, I've had at least one meeting um, on a subcommittee to develop the plan for a town hall budget meeting in a, in a town meeting, town hall format style. And then lastly, really to talk about our next steps and to um, set that budget schedule into place, so at least make a recommendation so we can take it back to the council for a full, uh, for their full support. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Dr. Antwistle mm -hmm. and Tom and the experts. Uh, well, we are taking on uh, the first agenda item is uh, the deployment of technology resources. And uh, we, I called out the big guns on this. Um, Winnie Culbertson, unfortunately, is uh, not feeling well and not here. Um, I will uh, fill in for her briefly. Um, we have David uh, Creech who will um, speak to the um, technology deficit, I guess, at 912. Um, and then basically uh, uh, Jen will provide an update on the status of the one-to-one -one, uh, proposal as it stands right now. Um, I guess I would direct your attention to this uh, rationale for uh, technology investments. And um, the red and the blue one here. I, I will uh, go through this quickly, but I believe that it does set the stage for the rest of the discussion that will happen. Um, I think that we all know and uh, can find lots of support to um, the statement that uh, the economic development of a community is strongly connected uh, to the strength of schools. Um, the second bullet addresses the fact that the strength of schools um, depends on regular, predictable, and adequate investments um, in order to uh, uh, stay on a, a path for continuous improvement. Um, I see the jobs of the schools as uh, uh, being uh, the preparation of students for the world after high school. So it's really for further learning, um, but ultimately for all kids, it's um, to prepare them for a career. Um, there are a few, if any, colleges or careers that don't depend on technology, technology tools, um, both the hardware and the software, and, the, and I think that we probably all agree that students and employees who are most capable with the application of technology are likely the ones that will have the biggest advantage, either in a learning situation or in a work situation. Um, if the uh, agenda addresses a, a, ref a technology refresh cycle. And that basically is uh, what we refer to as um, a focus on the technology needs of a specific school phase on a regular basis. And we follow uh, a cycle. And what we would be doing as we do the refresh is really addressing the teaching and instructional priorities for that particular phase and looking at what kind of investment will return the best uh, return um, in, in terms of benefit. So we do that on an annual basis. Um, 2016 is the year for investing in the high school. They are up on that cycle. Uh, the interesting thing about the, the high school is that um, 
it's generally always a big number um, when we look at a technology refresh. And um, it's probably just a mathematical um, uh, uh, function because, in fact, a third of all of the uh, Scarborough students are actually at the high school. So um, we, because we have the, um, uh, th that large a population there. Um, so the, the other unfortunate piece, I think, is um, that in the past refreshes, um, the high school has not um, actually received um, adequate resources. So we're a bit behind the times. And um, so it's not only a big place, but it's a place that really needs the most updating in terms of putting uh, technology at the fingers of uh, teachers and students. Uh, the next bullet, um, just a little bit more than halfway down the, the page, um, we are worried because we are seeing some changes in the student outcomes for the high school. Um, we regard ourselves as having a strong graduation uh, rate, which we do. Um, we regard ourselves as having uh, strong uh, testing scores uh, compared to other uh, districts, and, and uh, we have national uh, comparisons. Um, and that holds true, but it's not holding true necessarily for our high school. Um, we get kids into some pretty good schools, um, but we're hearing more and more that kids are not staying in school and or they are um, assessing their own skills and readiness as being something less than uh, their, uh, their um, classmates at college. So those things worry us, and that's been something that's been in the wind, the, the data is getting, uh, getting stronger. Um, so uh, think about, uh, think about this. At the Westbrook Vocational Center, we are the only sending school whose students do not have laptops. Um, another thing to think about, we're preparing students to use technology and technology tools in grades three through eight, which is fabulous and strong and good, but there's a precipitous drop um, to either limited or 20th century technology once you hit grades nine through 12. And I'd also say that we are limited as well, K1 and 2. Um, that doesn't worry us so much. And in fact, the solution in terms of a one-to-one -one deployment at the high school would allow us to redeploy other technology from the high school to our K2 school. So it would be a double bang for <coughs> the buck. Uh, third thing to think about, and we've and we've been um, this has been interesting because as the economy is gotten uh, stronger. We've had more retirements. We tend to then attract um, in uh, teachers with less experience, certainly, than the retired teachers. And we are hearing more and more from our teachers at the high school that they've got to change back or ch completely change the way that they teach because they, are, they were used to teaching with technology and they're arriving at Scarborough High School um, without technology. And it impacts their, uh, the instruction, the way that they go about their instruction and is impacting their students' learning. The bottom line is there's a disconnect right now between how our high school students are learning when they're at school and the rest of the 24 hours that they spend every day learning um, more independently or collaboratively with other folks. Um, David is going to speak a bit more about what's happening at the high school. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, if you wouldn't mind referring to this document, it's a document that has the yellow highlighted items on the front page. It talks about the educational benefits. <coughs> so uh, what I've prepared for you is not something that I'm going to go into in detail, but uh, I thought it would be important for you to have access to some of the notes from teachers in specific content areas regarding the benefits to one-to-one -to -one technology and also the impact of not having one-to-one -one technology in some of their classrooms. Uh, this information is collected from multiple resources. First, the grades three through eight information comes from the Wentworth School Teachers and Leadership and the Middle School Teachers and Leadership. So they've comprised for me uh, basically what they believe the benefits are currently for students in those grades. And then uh, from that point on, from the second page on, I actually had about eight pages filled with teachers' notes on each of the content areas, but I condensed this into one or two examples for each of the different points that I want to make about the benefits. Um, 
And I think what's important to start with is something that Dr. Entwistle alluded to a minute ago. So picture yourself for three to six years having the advantage of technology, whether it's your cell phone, your laptop, your remote control for your TV, whatever it might be. And you've used that effectively in whatever walk of life it is for three to six years. And then all of a sudden you're at, you come to a location where you can't use that at all. You can't use a laptop, you can't use your cell phone, whatever it is you've really learned to use and apply you no longer can use. That's what high school students are experiencing when they come to the high school. So three to six years of technology devices supplied for them, now they don't have those devices. The important piece to that with ninth graders about the disadvantages when they come to the high school and how they've had to restructure how they learn in each of their classes. If you look at the first page, um, just some of the overall benefits, there are examples for each of these listed here for you. You know, teachers have been able to develop websites so that their resources are on that website and important data for students to be able to access. If they have one-to-one -one devices, they can immediately access, access that information in class, during study hall or at home. Um, the one-to-one -one environment allows them to do research collaboratively in the classroom through Google Docs. Um, they're able to edit information on their computer, either at home or in class, and classmates that are a part of that collaborative effort can do the same thing in real time. Um, and teachers are able to also allow what we like to call a teachable moment. So here's the best example I can give you that based on an observation of a class at the Wentworth School. A teacher had a technology device where students were performing calculations in math. And they would put the answer on the, on the device and, and as soon as they were done that section, they would know immediately which, which examples they did correctly or incorrectly. <coughs> and then they could get instant feedback from the teacher and they actually, if they scored a certain score, they would there would be a certificate printed out for them out in the hallway. They could go get the certificate, come back in, and they could go from that particular section or content or learning into a new one within the same class period. Take those technology devices away. So you're giving a student an assessment. They have to go and do the assessment. Then they have to turn the assessment in. The teacher has to correct it that night, get it back the next day or two days later. They've already gone into a, a different content area. They're not getting that immediate response and that immediate feedback which is not only important for the student, so they'll understand whether they're doing it correctly, excuse me, but it informs instruction. It allows the teacher to know what they have to spend additional time on if a majority of the students are struggling in some area. So I think you'll find a lot of the benefits to the grade three through eight piece is what I just described. It's that real-time, immediate feedback and learning and that collaboration piece that can occur. Uh, Barbara Hathorne at the bottom of the page gave a nice summary for the benefits for grades three through eight that she's seen in the years that we've had one <coughs> technology at the middle school. So a lot of those I just, I just described to you. Um, a big piece that I haven't, haven't addressed yet is provide more substances opportunities for student choice when demonstrating content, knowledge, and understanding. With a laptop device or one-to-one -one technology, a student has more of a choice of how they're gonna demonstrate their knowledge and they don't have that with, without the device. So some important parts to, to emphasize in terms of what students are coming to us with. If you flip the page, I've broken this down into, again, six different areas of emphasis, and I'm not gonna go over these, but if you get a chance um, later on, please review these specific examples from the teachers that were given to me. Uh, one of the first benefits would be exploratory learning equals independent learners and thinkers. So our English department head had a traditional approach before he started piloting the use of Google Chromebooks in his classroom through our high school technology team. So in the past, he'd hand out an article from the newspaper magazine. There'd be a list of questions about the article. They'd read about the article, answer the questions on their own, pass this in. The teacher would read that, score it, and then get it back to the students similar to the approach I told you earlier without technology. If you look at his critical thinking, critical reading and thinking with technology, 
It's a much deeper discussion. It's a collaborative effort. They have right at their disposal the ability to research and in, in class have discussions with other students about resources that are available, which they wouldn't have if they didn't have the technology to device. So it's an opportunity to, to deepen their learning and have a more collaborative approach. If you flip the page, there are two more examples he gave regarding what he does in his English classes that I think would be worth checking into at a later time. The Google Classroom at the bottom of the page, an important <coughs> piece of this, and I, my daughters are in the middle school, they, they capitalize us on this all the time, is the shared documents. The ability to work collaboratively with your, your peers in a group, and each of you has edit privileges through a specific document. So you can be doing something at home and your classmate can see the changes you've made and you can work collectively on that in real time as opposed to having to come back to class, discuss what you've found and what you've done and make your changes there. So Google provides a great format for that. The next page talks about global learning communities. So there's no boundaries to the information students can, ac can access and utilize. So Lincoln McIsaac is one of our English language arts teachers, spoke specifically about what he's done to enhance learning in a specific area. He talked a little bit about his notes on Shakespeare and Macbeth. So here I am, a student that's able to go on to a laptop, and I can insert pictures, I can have links to videos, <coughs> I can do virtual tours of London. All of those things can be done in class or out of class because I have a device, which significantly enhances the learning experience. Um, Changing gears a little bit, I decided to, to give you an example of some of the resources for one-to-one -one in the visual and performing arts area. And I thought this was amazing. A lot of this I didn't know could be done until I got this feedback from Renee Richardson, who is our department head for visual and performing arts. Students can have real-time access to resources that enhance their understanding and practice of visual and performing arts. So imagine being able to go onto your laptop and hear how it's actually supposed to be played and then sing into it or play into it and actually be able to play that back and evaluate whether you're doing it correctly or not. All of that through, the, through a one-on-one -on -one laptop device. Um, the next page, enhancing your student productivity. This came from our business and computer instructor and our computer technology and, and basically these are their no-nonsense rationale for why even in the computer technology department where they have desktop computers, there are still distinct advantages to having one-on-one -on -one technology. And they listed a few of those there. It talks a little bit about the hour of code that we had uh, recently. So imagine learning something at a computer class and then having to wait until the next day to come back and apply some of that knowledge or to investigate it further. Where if they have one-to-one, -one, once they've learned it, they can explore and enhance that learning in the study hall, after school, before school, and at home. So it really enhances what they're able to teach students, even in the computer technology area. Um, another example would be more opportunities for customized, dis differentiated learning, where students can move at their own pace. And our foreign language department, Eric uh, Zavaznik, utilizes laptop cards. And obviously, all the department members can't have these laptop cards at the same time. But he talked a lot about how the ability to differentiate instruction is enhanced when his students have a laptop. And so he, he cited a few examples. Um, there are opportunities for them to hear real world language being spoken from that country and not just what you read in the text or how you hear it, how you hear it said in your classroom. So by allowing students to go and experience some of these things through technology, then they can actually, when they come back to class, it's more of the application of it and less of the learning piece to it because they've had exposure through the one-to-one. -one. And then finally, the last piece to highlight would be student ownership and independence of their learning. Our high school instructional coach, Adina Basler, was an English teacher prior to being our instructional coach. I've observed her class. She does a wonderful job with this. Picture instead of a, a normal research paper, um, she taught the skills for uh, creating your own documentary. And she did this with her, with her students because they used our computer lab. Of course, they could only get into the computer lab when they could sign it out, so it wasn't a fluid process. 
But instead of just doing a typical research paper, paper and pen or pencil, and going through it that way, they worked collaboratively and created a documentary. And they were able to do all the research and everything they needed through computers, which was a much more richer experience than they would have had typically. So, you know, in a nutshell, what I've provided for you is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what some teachers could do if they had one-to-one -one technology. Um, and I think the, the, most, the most important part for, for me is we take it very serious, the programs that we're putting in place, the offerings that we're providing for our students, because we don't want them just to be college and career ready. We want to provide them the best education that can be provided and, and not have any deficit for them in any way. And I think not having one-to-one -one creates deficiencies for some of our students. We've had some students who could, couldn't get into certain colleges because of the lack of certain skills or certain programs that we couldn't offer. And so I think um, having the one-to-one -one in grades three through eight and all the benefits for the learner and then all of a sudden coming to the high school and, and no longer having those benefits has impacted our students. I actually, uh, do you guys mind if you <coughs> ask questions as we go along? No. Yes, so I have a couple of questions and I go back a little bit. Um, the first question I have is, um, I think, uh, Dr. Antusel, you said that some of the teachers that come here may have to adjust and change their teaching approach because they've already been trained or experienced in certain technology. Is there a common thread of what technology is missing when they come here? It's what the students don't have access to. So they're, they have to go back to teaching in a way that is, that is not, the, not the same as what they were, not the same way as how they were teaching when every kid had a device. It's just it's the fact that they don't have the device. The student doesn't have right. a device. For example, one uh, one of the teachers who is a I think one of our math new math teachers uh, basically had to go back and she had lots of interactive mm -hmm. um, uh, access to interactive um, learning segments around supporting different uh, aspects of math. What she needed to do was that since the kids can all access that she needed to be able to use a projector and instead of having the interactive pieces of it, okay. it went without interactive and she had, she had to go back and convert a lot of her work into just PowerPoint <coughs> slides, which is kind of like, you know, that sort of thing. Rather than saying, okay, if you're there, now move over here. Those of you who, are, who, who got here, you know, now take this next step. You know, it's, it's really it's artful when you see a teacher teach with technology. Um, uh, David had <coughs> mentioned uh, the performing arts. I was actually in a middle school class, uh, a music class, and they were composing. The kids were composing, and of course they all have they all have their own laptop, so they're all composing at different at, at a different pace. And the teacher is really, in some ways, the facilitator, making sure that Bill's you know he's kind of taken off, so mm -hmm. he's, he knows what he's doing next. Tom is still kind of in the middle. You know, I'm struggling. And this teacher just very artfully, and that's what we talk about when we talk about differentiated learning. It is a, a classroom of <coughs> learners who are learning at a different pace, um, but having the teacher recognize where they are and what they need to do next and keeping them all moving ahead so that we're not all either lost because they're following the smart, the, the kid that's very capable, or if, if uh, they're teaching to sort of the middle ability of the class um, there are kids who are still going to be struggling and other kids who are who are going to be bored. So, um, yeah, so that was the feedback that we got. It, it, one of the last examples on, on number six where I, where I talked about Adina Basler, she's, she's an example of a teacher who came from a high school where she, um, she, she it says right here in, in what she gave us. So instead of me, the teacher, being responsible for finding articles, essays, and Im images, students found them according to their interest. And so I've gone into her classroom. It's like a workshop session, you know, that she, but she had to change how she taught <coughs> because of the student's lack of access to information. Yeah. Um, if I can just piggyback yeah. on that for a minute, too. I worked at the university in the past few years <coughs> in the ETEP program, which is a teacher training mm -hmm. program for people who have already graduated from college and now want to become a teacher. Um, the university is teaching their students how to use all these materials. 
that's how they learn how to teach now. So when they arrive in a situation like this, they're like, this is not what I'm prepared for. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, I've been using all these tools and now you have nothing? You, you, you just say to me, an old textbook? You know, so they're kind of, that's what's happening because when I went around to observe these, these teachers in, in a lot of the towns around Greater Portland and sat in the classrooms watching these interns teach, what I saw was all the technology they were using and all the tools they had and the smart boards in every classroom. I think the purpose of going through so. this exercise with the educational benefits are to really convey the fact that this is not just an internet search tool. It's a tool that's going to be very interactive and it really does affect the base learning capabilities of the kids <coughs> in the classroom. It's not just a laptop with Google go look stuff up on the internet. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes a, a, you know, they're not using the laptops and the technology the same way we might at home. It's not uh, you know, there to look up recipes or for to iTunes and all that other stuff. It's, it is an yeah. integral part of the learning process. Um, I think a couple things that weren't mentioned that are, are also very critical is the state itself is now structuring their, their assessments electronically. And we're running into some challenges, I think, this year with scheduling. Um, when Dr. Entrance will mention that of the Westbrook Vogue School, we're the only ones that don't have kids with laptops, I mean, there's at least a half a dozen sending schools in that school. Um, so it's not just, this is, I think the whole point is this isn't just a nice thing to have. This is really a, a critical piece of, of, of infrastructure that needs to be in place in order for us to really catch up with what the rest of the state and the rest of the communities around us are doing. Hi. May I say, my daughter had Ms. Basler last year. She did the documentary. Uh, and it was it was great to see the mm. collaboration with the students together. But um, my daughter's a freshman now at the University of Central Florida. When you arrive on campus, you either better have a laptop or, and so you need to have that for functionality right away when you arrive in classes. That's how the professors give you the materials. That's how you convey back and forth. And my daughter doesn't print up a uh, paper to turn in. It's like this is due mm -hmm. at midnight on such and such a date, and you better have been able to press send. And if you didn't have Wi-Fi in your dorm, you better find a way to get hooked up to some Wi-Fi because you're not walking to my office with a piece of paper and handing it to me. Right. And they return it back to her with notes in the side column annotated, you know, here's... And even they do that with rough drafts, and they work back and forth on that. So it's definitely... You know, one of the benefits I... It, we, I didn't talk a whole lot about this, the student piece here because I was taking it from the teacher's perspective and their ability. But just, I have two daughters that are at the middle school and, and uh, we live in Kennebunk. And so typically they wait for dad to come home because he's a former math teacher to go over the math piece. But I went online because they, all their stuff was online and showed them how to utilize the online resources. So now if dad's not home until late, they can go on and if they got something wrong, they can see how it's done correctly because of that online resource with examples of, of how to do that correctly, where in the past, if they didn't have somebody at home, mm -hmm. whether it's my children or somebody else's, they don't get it right, or they get it wrong and they don't know it's wrong, and then they have to wait to the next day to find out from the teacher. And it, it's amazing the difference in getting real-time feedback on whether you're doing something correctly or not. And that's not just in Kennebunk. I've got a student at the middle school in Scarborough who's doing exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's it, you know, you're doing it that way, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's, there is that sudden wall you hit of, you know, i got to actually, and, you know, good luck getting them to write legibly. That's the other challenge. <laughs> uh, I am I'm a total believer that, that this is so uh, part of the educational process that, that I have no doubt about the, the need for it. I think there is some documentation questions that uh, the public will want to have asked and answered. And there are things like which towns do have and do not have. And, uh, yeah, that, that and the presentation and, will answer. And I figure <laughs> that we're, we've already gone well past the, the time. So I'm just going to sort of, the, uh, what plan options are there? Uh, the, I noticed that we said that the level uh, of investment has not been uh, sufficient. Uh, that uh, student performance has dec leveled or declined, uh, that graduates are telling us they're not as well prepared. Our ability to document all of this, rather than just making an assertion, uh, I think is important. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the financing 
methods that are available, mm -hmm. whether it's to be capitalized versus expensed? We'll look at all that stuff in the, mm -hmm. in the, on the board finance side, for sure. So, so um, and we're talking about this today, so I, yep. I just, there's all that that I think uh, I'd want to know. I think that Jen, Jen is going to give you a status update, yep. and um, <coughs> I know many of the, the questions that you have will be answered, uh, but if there are still others, um, we will make sure that some things, for example, like um, uh, finance options, we really need to spend more time with Tom and with Ruth and with Kate and, and look at those things. So there, there are pieces that we're still working on, but this is the status update as to where we are right now. Did we bond the uh, uh, Wentworth School uh, one-on-ones? It was all part of the all whole Wentworth. It. it was all part of the full so project. So it was bonded. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, the infrastructure, everything. I mean, yeah, that it's all part of the building. Yeah, and I guess I guess my only piece was really kind of you know kind of piggybacking on on what you just heard, but what would be really helpful I think for our constituencies. You know, a lot of this is great information. You know, I believe in it too. But it would be if, if there's any information or empirical evidence that suggests that, that you know not having these devices really do impact you know ability to perform mm -hmm. and education those types of things. If there's a direct correlation between mm -hmm. having these and student performance, I think would really be mm -hmm. some some you know rather than stories, but something that some empirical research that really points to that would be really helpful for us to as we talk to our constituents about it. I mean, again, to me, I, and I, I understand that we'll go through that in finance too, but I mean, ultimately, if the state's going to start uh, uh, administering the state tests electronically, I, I don't know how else we can accommodate 600 plus students with the infrastructure that we have now. I mean, I think they're even looking at going off site, I believe, right, to do, to accommodate everybody. Or, I know, I, I think the AP students are, they were, you're, you're doing something creative with the schedule, but it's yeah. not, certainly not optimal by any stretch of the imagination. No. It, it just, it, I, I'm only yeah. anticipating that it's yeah. gonna, it's gonna yeah. be, there'll be a lot of questions asked, and the more, sure. the more we can anticipate the type of information, and sort of like the town hall meeting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We want to get our constituents sort of on board. So yep. I think Bill and I were just thinking about things that would help sure. in, in trying to send that message. Mm -hmm. One other point I wanted to make, Sean, back to your original question. Uh, what I've heard from the teachers who we actually have mm -hmm. piloting some of the one-to-one -one technology now is collaboration is huge. That's the piece that they miss. The teachers who are coming here from other districts who have had one-to-one -one in the past, they're used to being able to um, have students online, say on Google Docs, they write a paper, five students at seven o'clock at night all log on and they can all collaborate on the same thing. If you don't have one-to-one -one technology or you don't have technology at home, mm -hmm. that's impossible to do. Then that eats into class time because now you're having to have them break out in the group. So, so now you mm -hmm. sort of put them behind the curve. Okay. Um, and uh, to Chris's point, we are, we, since we have one-to-one, -one, three through eight, the microphone. Since we have one to one, three is that good? Um, three through eight, we are not having a big problem with the online testing piece three through eight. However, in the high school, we only have uh, computers basically that are capable of handling the online testing in labs. So now we're having to rotate them through these labs, and that is actually disrupting the technology classes. And so a lot of things are being put on hold. So you know we're already seeing it impacting um, regular curriculum. Okay. So one thing that I want to before I launch this, and I apologize, you guys are all back to the. Yeah, you should make yourself around. comfortable. Turn <laughs> the other way. Yeah, I did um, print this out in the handout, so you could follow along that way too. This is really just a status update. We are working on a full-fledged proposal, which will have a lot more answers to some of the questions that, like Peter, you were talking about. We have already received questions from the community, okay. so um, some specifically more policy-related questions. So we'll be working on getting some answers to those. But so this is just really a sort of here's where we are and here's some things that we've done to date. So to give you an idea, um, we've already talked about some of this. We are one-to-one -one grades three through eight. They have the HP um, laptops. Grades six, seven, and eight are provided through the MLTI program. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's the Main Learning Technology Initiative program. So those are essentially leased machines. Grades uh, three through five we've purchased. We own those. 
Um, those are not taken home at night by students. Those are actually stored in carts. And um, I know for a fact that they're taken out every day and used and then put back because when we do spot checks where we walk through the hallways, we see the laptops open, we see the projectors on, um, and the kids are really using them. The high school right now has four desktop labs with about 18 to 22 desktop computers in each of them. Um, and there are a number of laptop carts it's really difficult to schedule time is what I've heard from different teachers. Um, they do tend to sort of fight over the carts and it impacts their curriculum if they can't get a hold of a cart, particularly if they have planned a very specific online, um, online program that day or that week, then they're trying to sort of, you know, wheel and deal with the other teachers to get a hold of the carts. The other thing I want to emphasize is we've talked about this a little bit. We have moved to Google. Uh, Google Drive is where we are moving all of our documents. Today actually was the sort of official shutdown of the G Drive. So documents and data that we've stored on servers that are in this building have now been moved to Google. And what that provides is sort of online anytime access for students and staff. So now the students don't have to come into school, log into a drive, flip their document, oh no, it's the weekend, I can't get a hold of that document because it's stored here. They can get a hold of it anytime it's on their Google Drive. Google Drive, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, it provides a lot of other tools. It's not just a word processing um, tool. It's also, it's got something that's equivalent to Excel, something that's equivalent to PowerPoint. Um, you can do surveys. There's a lot of functionality that's available there. So that's part of the reason why we moved um, people to Google, and part of it, as I'm sure you all being finance committee folks can appreciate, was a monetary issue for us because by moving everything online, obviously we reduce the strain on the internal systems and we reduce the cost for having to purchase and maintain those systems. A couple of things I just wanted to bring up before we kind of launch into this is um, some acronyms that I'm gonna be using. Um, you've probably heard of them, but I'm just gonna give you a brief explanation of what they are. BYOD is bring your own device. Uh, this is where users essentially bring their own device. You know, it could be any device. It could be this one. It could be a computer. It could be a, a tablet. Um, we essentially have this already in the district because we do have public net, and public net is available um, at all of our schools. So you could potentially bring in a device. I think if you asked students or staff how many people BYOD, quite a few of them would say that they do, but you know, I don't know if you've ever tried to write a term paper on one of these. It's not really possible. And we have heard that from other school districts who did decide to go the iPad route for middle school and high school. Particularly the high schoolers, what I've heard from my fellow tech directors is it's rough because, you know, if you're on an iPad and you're trying to bring up the keyboard, it's literally taking up half of the, the screen space. So to write a, you know, 15-page term paper is nearly impossible. Um, VDI is Virtual Desktop Infrastructure or Virtual Desktop Interface. Essentially what that provides is kind of behind the scenes, it's a virtual desktop, so you browse into it, you know, just like you would a website, you browse into it and you see a personalized desktop for you. So you would have your printers, you would have your applications, you would have access to your folders. Um, if somebody else browses into the virtual desktop, they see their printers, they see their folders and their applications. It, so it's, it sits on a server behind the scenes and you can have you know, as many seats as you want to purchase. Uh, they've done this out at Wyndham. Wyndham, I think, purchased 200 or 250 seats. So essentially 200, 250 students or staff can be on the virtual desktop at the same time. So we did, just to give you some background, we did meet with um, several groups of teachers up at the high school, and we had requirements definition sessions. And we said to them, what is absolutely a need, requirement, can't live without in your classroom on a one-to-one -one device? And this is a list of what they gave us. So obviously keyboards, what they meant by keyboards, we did have a long discussion about this, is an integrated keyboard. So not a keyboard that pops up on your screen like on, a, on an iPad. Um, they really did not prefer the type of keyboard too that you would essentially connect to an iPad. They wanted something that was um, permanently connected. 
um, they do have a lot of specialty software that they have already purchased, already licensed at the high school. This is a must for them. I know particularly the math department, the science department has probe where they don't want to live without that because a lot of their curriculum is actually built around the functionality of that software. Um, recording audio, video, I mean a lot of these are sort of standard, you know, a couple of USB ports because they might have peripherals that they have to plug in like a microscope or um, a microphone or, you know, camera or something. Um, HDMI port, headphone jack, um, they want to be able to save to the hard drive, which is going to be something that we'll talk about in a minute with one of the options that we have. Seven hour battery life minimum, um, multimedia card readers. They did want some kind of sleeves that the kids could put the devices into, so could essentially put them in their backpacks. Um, obviously secure the ability to charge during the day. And then they had some <coughs> nice to have. And one, one thing that's missing from this is we went back and forth about whether or not a touch screen was really a requirement. And they did decide that yes, a touch screen would be a requirement. And part of it is, I was encouraging them to think not just sort of in the here and now, but think about what technology and what your curriculum and what the classroom is going to look like four years down the road, because that's definitely how long we would have these devices. Um, nice to have stylus so that they could do handwritten notes and the teachers could annotate as they went along. Um, and then the ability to do Skype or Google Hangouts, essentially the ability to collaborate with other classrooms you know, around the country, around the world. So we took these requirements and we went out to vendors and we tried to match up devices to these requirements. And this is, these are the four options that we came up with. So if we start out, let me start out with the second one over, which is the HP ProBook 440. Okay, that is what the teachers and the um, students have right now, grades three through eight. The 440 is the device that is provided by MLTI for grades six through eight. So we went ahead and purchased those for um, the, mid, uh, the intermediate school, primarily to keep some consistency. Um, you know, if you purchase extra parts or you have repairs or whatever, you know, it's, it's easier to have um, the same model, the same make. The, we, we didn't want to just stick with HP, though. We really wanted to give everybody an option um, to look at some different, not just make some models, but some different functionality. So on the left, you'll see the HP 210G1. That's a touchscreen model. This, I want to emphasize, is one of the things that they told us at the high school is they wanted something that was relatively small and portable. So that is an 11.6-inch screen. It's a full laptop, though. It has full laptop capability. Um, it, I will, and we'll get into that in a minute. I'll kind of take you through the different devices. The Lenovo ThinkPad is this, pretty much the same thing as the 210G1. It's an 11.6-inch screen. However, it is not a touch screen. The Samsung Chromebook, that is, I don't know if you all have seen what Chromebooks are. Essentially, it is just a portal to the Internet. Okay, It doesn't have any hard drive memory space. So, well, that one has a little bit, so you could temporarily store something before you move it. I think it's like 16 gigs. Um, but you can't actually load applications to it, software to it. You can't store huge amounts of data on it. Thus, we have built into the cost of that Chromebook the VDI, so the Virtual Desktop Interface, which means purchasing back-end servers and providing that virtual desktop out. So that kind of, I'll go back to that slide, that gives you the cost. What I did was, instead of just giving you an upfront cost of, boom, here's what's going to cost year one, we're all done, I wanted to, to extrapolate it out over six years so you could sort of see what the cyclical replacement cost would be. So you can see the six-year totals, and then you can see that annualized out over six years. And yeah, that's not just hardware, though, right? There was maintenance as well that's built into that? Everything is built into that. Yep, maintenance costs. Um, we have built in costs, and I do have um, a much more detailed <coughs> spreadsheet that we'll be providing with the proposal. But this is just wanted to give you sort of a high-level summary here. But yes, that includes maintenance. That includes our maintenance that we do on anything that's not covered by um, accidental damage protection. That includes the cost of the hardware, the bags. Um, it includes the cost of any battery chargers that we need, spare batteries, spare chargers. 
Um, in the case of the Samsung Chromebooks, it also includes the back-end cost of the servers and the desktop virtualization. Ken, would the annualized cost, roughly speaking, be what we see uh, from this point uh, after six years on? That's essentially what we have to pay every year? We would need to budget that? You would need to budget, for the next six years, you need to budget what's listed out years one through six. And then I figure after year six, we'll kind of reassess and see what other devices are out there. Does this, you know, does staying with that device make sense or is it time to move on? So if you take the requirements that we um, gathered from the teacher groups that we spoke to and you break them out into the different devices, this is kind of how it breaks down. Really the HP 210G1 is the only device that kind of meets all those requirements. But we do pretty, we come pretty close with the other devices. And this is what we were talking about with the peer comparison. So we did go out to um, neighboring school districts and we took a look. Do you have one-to-one -one in your high school? Now, this is all different types of one-to-one -one programs. You know, they might be through MLTI leasing, they might be laptops, they might be MacBooks. Um, we didn't break it down, you know, into that much detail, but just to let you know, Brunswick and Scarborough are the only two school districts right now that do not have one-to-one -one for high school. So to go into some of these devices and just give you a little more information. 210G1, we talked about that. It's a smaller screen, touch screen. It meets all of the basic requirements. It's going to want run on Windows 8.1, but we can actually roll it back and purchase with Windows 7, which is going to be probably important for us with some of the software that we have. Because if you think about if you purchased software two years ago, might not have had Windows 8, might not be compatible, so we're going to want to roll that back to Windows 7. It's only three and a half pounds. So it kind of meets that really highly portable um, requirement that the teachers had. And it would be really easy for the kids to sort of stick in a sleeve and put in their backpack. The ProBook 440 is a full-size laptop. So you're going to have the 14-inch LED screen. It's not touch screen, but it has, and it's almost it's four and a half pounds. Um, they guarantee a nine-hour battery life. I mean, let's be realistic about the battery lives. You know, they're going to tell you that it's nine hours. It's nine hours if you have it so dim you can't really see the screen, <laughs> and, you know, if you're shutting it down between every breath. Um, so will it really go nine hours? No. Actually, we've found in the middle school that it probably won't, but it will last most of the day, and particularly if you're diligent about recharging it at night. Um, it has all the rest of it, HDMI, microphone, USB, 4 gig of RAM, 500 gig hard drive. Um, I, I really wanted at least an i3 processor just to sort of keep up with um, the app. Lenovo ThinkPad, as I mentioned before, it's pretty much the same thing as the HP 210G1, but without the touch screen. It just was a different manufacturer. I wanted to give you guys a, you know, taste of what it, the cost comparison would be going Lenovo versus HP. And then we get into the Samsung Series um, 3 Chromebook. And again, that's much, much smaller. It's only two and a half pounds. Um, but it has much less capability. It's just essentially a portal to the internet. So we would have to have that VDI. The VDI with 200 concurrent seats on the back end is going to cost us initially about $350,000. And then there are annual maintenance costs, which again are built into the summary sheet that I gave you. So that's... Quick question, Jen. Is the VDI contract, is that annually renewed or is that part of the hardware purchase? Or is um, it a separate contract? It's a separate contract. You can purchase it, I think it's with either two-year or three-year maintenance. So we would purchase it with some type of maintenance. Um, just to let you know a few other small details. So what we would look at doing is purchasing these devices with some kind of what they call ADP, which is accidental damage protection. Essentially, it's a warranty to the device. There's different types of warranties that you can buy. You can buy, you know, just like with cars. Okay, you can buy the bumper-to-bumper -bumper warranty, so if you rip off a mirror, it's covered. Or you can buy just the powertrain warranty, which is if your engine block falls out or you're driving, that may or may not be covered. We would buy the ADP, which is essentially the bumper to bumper. So what that covers with most <coughs> of these companies are, you know, spills, somebody accidentally takes a glass of water and dumps it on your keyboard, that would be covered. You crack a screen, 
you drop it on the ground. It does not cover intentional damage, which, believe it or not, we have had that happen here. Sure. Um, and, you know, if you drive over it with your car and there's actually tire tracks on it, which, yes, I've seen that too, that probably also will not <laughs> be covered. But for the most part, it is a bumper-to-bumper -bumper warranty. We can buy that, depending on the manufacturer, you can usually buy that in one year, two years, three years. Sometimes with HP, you can buy four-year blocks. We would try to buy it with three years. So essentially what that would do is give us three years before we would have to start looking at that cyclical replacement cost. What I built in to these numbers, though, is replacing most but not all. So you're going to see, um, I think, and what years four and five are more capital intensive again? Yes. Exactly. Yes. So, and the reason why I built the budget that way was because the the high school is going to come up again for um, renewal for tech refresh. So I tried to put the bulk of the the cyclical refresh into that year, and then the other year would be the year where Wentworth comes up. And I think Wentworth, you know, we can kind of scale back a little bit because we do have a lot of technology down there that's brand new. We're obviously going to have to replace some of the laptops down there, so that would be built into the Wentworth budget, but I did try to sort of push those back. Um, there's at any given time going to be 100 or 200 laptops that are not covered at all by any kind of ADP. To, to cover those devices, we will probably charge parents some type of maintenance program fee like we do at Wentworth, just like we do at middle school, and that fund would go in to um, maintain those laptops that aren't covered. We are looking at some of the policy questions, as I mentioned. There were questions about, um, you know, would we have, would parents actually have to make some kind of investment? Um, do the kids take them home? Do, what network do they connect to? So we are working on that. We'll have some answers in the full-fledged proposal. For us, this is something that we've been doing for a very long time, though. We've had the MLTI program for 12 years, I think it is now, and with Wentworth, we you know, are in full swing there. We haven't seen, knock on wood, any major catastrophes down there. So we are sort of old hands at you know, maintaining this type of program, having these policies, educating the parents, educating the students. A lot of it is really just in that upfront educational piece. Giving something to to, to parents through three eight, right. parents Nothing. and students will go through. Yeah, they'll show up for the meeting. That's right, mandatory right. meeting. <laughs> Questions? That was, that was really good. Yeah, and remember that we're still Carried. still preliminary. We're still it's still yeah. we're beginning the process. It's just a first blush, so we're still working. Can I ask, Jay? Can I assume that you would not at all recommend the Chromebook option without VDI? That's not an option. Yeah, that's not an option. Just because of the the software that we already own that we would have to use on a regular basis, you can't use that without the VDI backend. And I also would not recommend BYOD. I know that there have been a lot of questions, and I'm sure that the constituents will have a lot of questions about, well, why don't we have the students bring their own device? What we found, I've attended in doing research for this over the past two years, a lot of sessions with a lot of different school districts from literally all over the country. And what I've learned from them, they made the mistakes for us. <laughs> they learned the hard way and then we kind of learned from them. Um, one in particular I thought was a really good example of sort of BYOD gone awry. Um, I believe it was a school district in Pennsylvania that um, said year one, okay, we're going to have BYOD. So bring any device you want, we're all set up, we're ready to go. So the parents went out and they bought anything. Think of all the different computers and operating systems and versions and <laughs> whatever that you could possibly bring in. Apple, Samsung, you know, I mean anything. They brought them in, and what they found was they were spending the first 15 to 20 minutes of every single class <laughs> trying to help the students log on to the system. They eventually bailed out of that and said in year, I don't even know if they made it through a full year, I think it might have been halfway through that year, they said, okay, this enough is enough, we're going to have to tell you, you have to buy one of these three devices. Well, the parents said, no way. 
you told me anything. I already spent $500 on a device. I'm not going to go out and buy another device. Now you're just going to have to make it work. So what they ended up doing, I don't know if it was in year two or at the end of year one, they, they ended up basically just abandoning that whole model and going to a school-provided device because that was the only way that they could be assured that they weren't going to be wasting 20 minutes at the beginning of every class trying to get the students logged on. If you think about, if you have a classroom of 22 kids and one of them cannot log on, you are at a standstill. You cannot do anything in your classroom or on your curriculum until that one kid is able to log on. And they may not be able to. You may eventually end up having to just provide a device for them. And you're obviously going to have a percentage of kids um, who are unable to purchase a device. For us, that's roughly 15, 20 percent. So right there, you've got, you know, 20 percent And then more that are unwilling to do it. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's and, true. And, and you uh -huh. still have the cost of the VDI because you've got to have uniform software and interfaces back and yep. forth, and you've got to have that shared capacity and things like that. So you've still got the added cost of the VDI on the back end. Well. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why we've opted against BYOD. I, um, on the peer comparison, is there anything to be learned from the experiences of those that have done this in terms of what devices work and what don't? We talked about some of that already. I, I um, and I'm sure that some of my my tax director peers out there who who may or may not be watching this, I hope they have something else to do with their time to watch this. Um, but they, I think, would probably disagree. Some of them would disagree with me. But what I've heard about iPads, any type of tablet like that, it's very difficult to use in the classroom because you have to ensure that they all have keyboards. So that's an additional purchase price. The keyboards where they connect is always a problem because whether you have magnetic connections or prong connections, you know, you're inevitably going to get something, especially if it's going in and out of a backpack, you're going to get something jammed in there. Um, so you always have a, an issue with that, and the keyboard does take up a considerable amount of space on the screen itself. So I would say tablets, I've learned, probably not the way to go. Um, there are some schools out there that are attempting BYOD, but I believe that they do mandate what the device is going to be. <coughs> Do they have tablets <coughs> that have um, um, MH or MDHI or, or uh, USB? The H or they, um, what you can do is, for example, mm -hmm. with um, the HP Elite Pad, mm -hmm. which is a you know competitor of the iPad, you can buy, they call them productivity jackets. So they snap in, and with that, you'll have two or three HDMI or USB ports. I think there's a card reader slot on there. So yeah. Nothing like that for Apple. Um, not that I am aware of, no. I mean, the iPads don't, no. And that's, that is a drawback because with, particularly with the iPads, there's no USB connectivity, so you can't actually you know, transport documents or anything back and forth. Thank you very much. Yep. Nice done. Thank wonderful. You. So I'm assuming that you guys you're hearing this for the first time or second time, yeah. so you've got a whole analysis that you've got to go through as a finance committee, mm -hmm. just sort of sort it through. We'll be asking a lot of the similar questions that you're asking for sure. sure. Um, yeah. And you know, it, obviously, if there's things that you'd like answered, at, you know, get it to us as we go through the process. We'd be happy to just let you know as we discover it. Um, but it is very early in the process for sure. And they're they're fairly thorough with their analysis, so it really does kind of come down to, um, you know, long-term functionality, and you know the costs are pretty pretty much they are what they're going to be up there. You know, there's there's a whole lot of uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of room to play around with that. And at what point are you going to address the options as far as financing or payment? That's, that's one of the next steps that in terms of meeting with, um, with Tom and Ruth, Kate and the small core group that we have to really um, explore some of those. That that's, that's, uh, that's one of the next steps. That's also part of the formal proposal process that they put in front of us. When they have a proposal, they'll talk about where they think the funding should come from, um, the ideas that they have for you know, financing, financing and where right, the options Even though it's a bond, potentially a bond issue, that's one of your options. It right. isn't a, a referendum issue. No. No. Not There's no single... Uh, item costs four hundred thousand dollars, but the whole package would cost a million. Right. 
Right. We have a legal opinion that supports that right. interpretation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, and it would be <coughs> similar to the types of amounts that we've seen in our tech refresh years. It's obviously it's it's a good bit grander than than that because, <coughs> as George said, it's a high school. It's the biggest. Um, Population. <coughs> the biggest phase that we have to, to address, but it would be handled in a similar way to our, our CIP proposals for technology. Just in terms of budgeting, it's exactly. just impractical to, to expense. Uh, and that's, I mean, you know, that's where we've been with the refresh, tech refresh for, you know, as long as I've been looking at this. It's, it's not something that we've been able to build into our operating budget <coughs> as much as we'd like to. And obviously, we will leverage the relationships that we have with these vendors as much as possible to try to, you know, get those pricing down, maybe bundle some things together. We did well with Wentworth. You know, we were we were able to come in under our initial technology budget. So, you know, I would anticipate that we could go back to some of these vendors and say, we have this long standing relationship with you. You know, what what can you do for us? Good. Thank you. Good. So, good. Um, good. So with that, not to cut the conversation short, because it's been very fruitful, is to move on to the next item. We uh, we are a little bit over um, on developing a level service budget for uh, Kate. I have you down as providing us with. Uh, and we, you, you may wish, uh, you know, as uh, um, as we sometimes are or often are, we were ambitious in terms of what we thought we could fit into an hour, and so you know we can we can happily defer this as our agenda item for our next meeting. You want to do that? It will, it will, it, it's another 25 um, minutes. Or so. oh, it is a full. It's a, it's a pretty. Uh, okay. It's a pretty. I'd rather, process. I'd, if there's no objections, I would rather wait. If you guys are all okay with that, well, we know the process. We go through it every year, so we're comfortable with it. Um, and I. Thank you. I do talk fast. But <laughs> I just as soon be I just as soon be somewhat intelligible. <laughs> okay. Um, perhaps we could skip to the. Um, oh yeah, because then we can wrap this up. Set up the next time. meeting, and then I can put myself on management. That's right. That's a good idea. Okay. Okay. Uh, then moving over to appointments of a subcommittee to develop the plan. So I know that we originally talked at that first meeting about um, uh, Councilor Donovan and uh, Chris um, actually setting up that meeting. I know um, <coughs> Bill had been out of town for quite a few uh, for a couple of trips, so I did have a chance to sit down with Chris. To, over a cup of coffee to get that kind of conversation started, um, as well as um, having spoken with uh, Chairwoman um, Holbrook from the Town Council, and I believe Chris may have talked with um, Ms. Bealey as well. So just to kind of give uh, a high-level overview, of, and I apologize, I was going to have something typed, but I've been uh, uh, extremely busy today and I didn't get a chance this morning, but really the conversation, um, and I've actually had a chance to talk with Tom as well, is to really it's to um, finalize a budget timeline so that we know what our specific dates are and then try to determine from that what are at least two, um, maybe just one uh, public hearing or, or a town meeting format of a, of a presentation, um, determine what is the best place and obviously having maybe two alternatives uh, between the two uh, dates and then um, identifying the resources that are required um, to be able to do that presentation. Um, so as we go through this, I hope everyone understands that um, I'm the type of person I'd rather set a baseline and have it change, whether it goes up or down, doesn't matter to me. But I, um, sometimes I, I'm not really too eclectic or uh, kind of a tree hugger and just want to throw things out there. So in setting a baseline for this, um, outside of the dates, which I think have to be somewhat specific because of the timeline, is very specific. Um, some of the semantics, what I had talked with Chris about was that maybe what we do in that public hearing format is to have it uh, more of a um, comfortable approach, not where we sit behind a desk like this that's in the chambers, um, or even a panel desk that's up on a stage, but maybe if you format it so that it's, um, we have a moderator, an unbiased mo or an unrelated moderator. Uh, I've thrown a couple of names out to Tom. We have Kevin Freeman, who has been the past president of the chamber, and he's, been on, he's currently the chair of SEDCO. Um, has hosted several things for us over, over many years. He's done an excellent job. And then possibly even Rick Snow, who's the current chairman mm -hmm. of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, um, a, a very good moderator as well. So uh, we've got a couple of names out there that are community members. Um, just so you know, Rick is not a citizen of Scarborough, but he is a business owner in town. So 
he even lends a little, little bit of a different perspective to that. So I'm either one or maybe both of them, one for each. It uh, depends on their availability. But really the style of this is, not, is to be almost, um, I can't think of the guy's name that has the director's chair show where they sit up on stage in director's chairs. They go Lipton, back and forth. Lipton? Lipton? Yeah, Lipton. 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 You know what I'm talking about? Where you just sit there, you basically you're just in comfortable chairs and you sit there. and um, it, It's still a little bit of formality. Um, Chris and I talked about doing the presentation for our respective groups about the budget, and it's at the highest level with some detail. And then up on stage, we would also have um, both uh, chairwomen of our um, governing bodies to be there. And then also have certain staff that are identified by, by both Dr. Entwistle and then Tom to represent the town, but then also have available um, their other department heads. They may not all be up on stage, but um, the council members, the school board members, other staff members from the respective groups could be there as well to answer questions. And then we'll have, in essence, a, a couple of microphones out on the floor. Um, we'll give everyone cards where if they don't want to get up, some people will get a little nervous in front of a microphone. They can write them down, they can hand them in, we'll kind of moderate that process. Um, the goal is that we may also have a couple of scribes that we'll go through. We'll definitely have a TV um, with the goal of, you know, here's the questions and here are the answers that were provided and then providing an online resource that people can download what those questions are if they can't make it. Um, I haven't really thought about social engagement, as far, uh, social networking, you know, Twitter and I don't know. I'm not really into that that much um, other than my own Facebook account. So mm -hmm. I'll take recommendation of Tom and George and anybody else who thinks that we need to do it. But um, I'd rather have people in the audience mm -hmm. than just sending us uh, tweets. <laughs> um, but um, I, you know, I'm open to whatever we're most comfortable with as a group. That's kind of like the baseline that we had talked. Uh, did I miss anything? That no, I, I mean, I think really the venue is, is going to, you know, the date is obviously key. Uh, the venue we talked about possibly went worth. I don't know if it will accommodate it has to be the that. High school. Well, it does have to be the high school? Okay. Um, but, uh, you know. Um, and it's all reserved. It is all reserved. Okay. I think we've selected the date. Um, I mean, I can April so yeah. around. This is, a, this is something this group decided on back on, yeah, the, I think, the 21st of January, 22nd of January. And uh, the date, so at least this schedule uh, provides for is April 29th. Now you did say, Tom, this would be in lieu of the typical public comment session that, that happens before uh -huh. the, or is uh, it in combination with? I mean, it's set up, this schedule is set up that it falls in between first and second reading, so I don't see any reason with proper notice that it couldn't satisfy the public <laughs> hearing process. It's certainly not the conventional way. Uh, but I don't think that's what we're striving for. We're looking for more of an interactive mm -hmm. session. So I, I think that so long as we provide adequate legal notice and it constitutes a public hearing requirement, I think it can go both birds. Okay. You can work that out with, uh, with Tody. With Tody and yep. Councilor Hoberg. Certainly. Okay. Yep. So I, don't know if there's, uh, I don't know if there's a forum of the council that needs to be there. You know, so there's all kinds of legal things you're going to pass, right? Yeah, I think uh, I attendance of the members of the town council would be important, whether they're an active participant, but to be there okay. and witness the questions and, and more importantly, the comments. And mm -hmm. That's the simple sure. legal threshold that needs to be satisfied that uh, the elected officials are there and witness to the comments from the public. We're going to take a step further and try to answer questions mm -hmm. uh, in an interactive format, which is, uh, should be widely appreciated, I think, <coughs> by, by folks. I do anticipate, though, and, and this is a conversation we can take offline at, at another date with the subcommittee, that some of these questions are likely to be extremely specific and uh, for which staff will be doing our best to field. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. between George and I, we can make sure our key staff are available such that we're able to anticipate and field nearly all those questions. And clearly, those that we don't know, we'll have to tell them that we'll get back to them. And that's not the end of the world. I think it was one of the mm. things that we talked about, too, was how do we park a lot of issues that either we yeah. don't have the information at the time, yep. or you know, as long as I think we come up with a good format to say, look, and explain that ahead of time. If we don't have the information yet because we're waiting on Augusta or whatever the situation may right. be, we park and lot it somewhere, mm. wherever we, we, we log it, keep track of it. And the question is, do we just respond to that individual, or do we put it out in the public? Forum somewhere, but those are kind of. Yeah, I think those are the semantics, logistics. but mm -hmm. I think yeah, I think the point is that we'll 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 do our best yep. to, to to answer what we can on site. That's kind of the purpose, right. and mm -hmm. uh, as long as we have a feedback mechanism to to get other information out, I I, I think we should be okay. But Sean, um, yeah, 
in my conversation with, with George, I mean, George, you shared a process by which uh, some of the town meetings, you, you, people might be interested in a certain topic, and didn't you kind of like organize the groups and sort of by topic, so people that were interested in whatever it might be can kind right. of congregate and there can be a resource there. I, I don't know if that fits this, but we have limited time, so I don't know if it makes sense trying to, you know, segregate the groups and the areas they might be interested in and then, you know, divide up the resources to answer those. I, I don't, I mean, I, I, I kind of saw this as literally just, I mean, for lack of a better word, just a, an open forum. Yeah. I mean, the, the reason for the moderator there is to kind of prevent um, people from maybe asking inappropriate things or not asking things that are germane yeah. to the topics that we're discussing. And I think that's why the discussion was to have somebody look as fairly neutral as possible so that they could moderate that and, 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 and be impartial. Um, but I think as long as we, you know, we, I think a couple ways we could do it. We could solicit input ahead of time via online. If there's information that comes in, we can review those. Um, and then also Sean and I talked about possibly, you know, how do we deal with people that are coming with questions for the first time. Do we have them write them on cards, hand them to the moderator, have the moderator ask a question, or do we give the, the microphone and have that dialogue, um, you know, that more of that exchange type of format, or do we just ask the question and then we discuss like a, a panel type thing or something, and then if there are follow-up questions, we could go that way. I think those are the, the, the logistics that, that, are, that are a little bit, uh, we can discuss, I think, in the, in the, in the subcommittee, and then have something to prepare back for everybody to, mm -hmm. to say, here are our different options. Which is the best way to go? So you know, from a format point of view, uh, I think encouraging people to uh, some people will want to get up there and say, "Listen, I just want to tell you mm -hmm. that I think it's crazy to do X." Mm -hmm. You know, yep. and that's just because that's they yep. want to voice that. Right. Uh, other people will actually have uh, just questions mm -hmm. that they'd like answered, and so the questions probably could be better answered if they were written so that if there were common questions, mm -hmm. they, somebody could be putting them all together and, and a better effort could <coughs> be made because if they can be passed to whoever, whoever might be best able to, then they can reflect on it and, and give mm -hmm. as thorough an answer as possible. Mm -hmm. So without trying to, you know, control or overmanage the thing, mm -hmm. I think if people understood that if they just wanted to make a comment, Feel free. Go ahead. Okay. If you've got questions, you might want to write them down and pass them in because then we can do a better job of making sure somebody gives it some thought. Well, and I think to that point, I think we were looking for: do we want a <coughs> structure? Do we want it? Do we want more of an exchange and a dialogue format? Because, you know, I think that's that's something we can address. So how we really anticipate this? My thought was it would be more of an interaction because we don't often have that opportunity to have that dialogue and discussion back and forth. And with the moderator there to kind of keep everything in, couched into perspective, I think that, that would be helpful. But to the point of having to have the ability to have public comment, perhaps we do have a clock up there that say you've got three minutes. If you want to ask a question in that, you know, it'd be better to write it down ahead of time. But I think as long as we lay those parameters out ahead of time. There should be some structure. Mm. Yeah. 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 And, and, maybe, yeah. and maybe what we do is split it in half so that the first section of the um, hearing is um, that engagement. And then the second half become the public comment, therefore constituting the public hearing mm -hmm. section of that. So I, I'm, I'm I may whatever be, you. I may be wrong. My expectation is you'll hear more comment than you will question. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But probably. I, I say that, and we've never provided this kind of venue, so I might be entirely wrong in that regard. And then the question becomes: Do we do we do similar to what we do here in chambers? Do we limit it to three minutes because of the the time constraints, or do we? Yeah. I, that's that's, that's something we can address. And I think it needs to be limited both ways because mm -hmm. yeah. myself or a staff member could give a 10 minute soliloquy. <laughs> uh, and um, that's or a 25 minute PowerPoint. Can we, <laughs> <laughs> right. can we use the same system, Tom, that you have provided here for the town council, the red light system? I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's also, I think, an opportunity here to uh, have uh, an exchange or a follow up because. You might get an answer, and you really <coughs> may feel like the, the answer missed the mark, or there's a natural follow-up. Mm -hmm. And so written questions aren't exactly conducive to follow-up. So you may yeah. want to say uh, that you would be able to have pass in your questions, yeah. but feel free to, right. to be at the podium uh, to, to ask a follow-up question if yours is the one that's being addressed. 
what we even, that's what we were talking to about having people roaming the aisles, if you will, the two aisles in the, in the, in the high school auditorium with a microphone. So if right. somebody wants to volunteer, raise your hand and, As a you know, follow-up. Yeah, right. state your yeah. name where you're that's the, the dialogue thing. we're talking exactly. about. Exactly, right. right. Exactly. But, but, but again, I think as long as we lay that structure out ahead of time and everybody understands what that is in the public, yeah. um, you know, address the questions to the moderator and everything is kind of funneled through them. And, and I, I, you know, why yeah, they're, they're the gatekeeper. Exactly. You know, they understand exactly. when the follow-up's appropriate or when yeah. to right. move on to the next. Right. Mm -hmm. Exhausted this issue. Right. But also, if, if, if it comes in on a card to the moderator and it's in the form of a question, there needs to be the name of the person sure. and where they live in Scarborough on yep. that card. And a moderator would then say, this comes from so-and-so. And, -so, and he Yes, I that. think that's... that's because right. if you want to do a follow-up follow -up, or you need to do a follow-up and you really want that person to get the answer, now you, yeah, you might be yeah. able to contact them. Yeah. You could even suggest that that person put down, if they, if they want to really get into mm -hmm. a conversation, yeah. put down a phone number or an email Absolutely. address or something mm -hmm. like that where yeah. they could be contacted. Because I've had a few um, citizens contact me recently and... I go to try to find them, and there's no phone number for them. They don't want to. They don't want to. You know, they don't have. Uh, I don't. I can't access them to talk to them directly, which I find is far more effective. I, I think that's good, but I also think it's important that we that whatever responses we do make are in public and they're published somewhere so everybody can see. I mean, it's important to have that one-on-one. -on -one, hey, did we? Did you? Did you get your question answered? And, it's just your satisfaction and their follow-up things. That's one mm. thing. I think it's another thing that when we when the information goes out, you got to have a whether it's an online repository on one of the websites or some mm. other way that we decide in the process where to put that stuff out. Uh, the you could you could combine those two things. You could say, right. Hey, Mr. Smith, I just posted an answer to your question. There was right. some other interesting feedback. Why don't you go have a look at the website? Here's the link. Right. So uh, um, so with that in mind, we have uh, pretty much two dates set. April 1st and April 29th as the two public hearings or um, uh, the town hall format of our uh, budget presentation. So I, I hope that, um, so today is what, the 23rd? Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to go over what is our next steps as far as meetings because I would like to, maybe Chris and I will come up with an outline and break it down into four or five major components of this public hearing to include everything so you can see that we've covered it all. Um, as far as what's going to be included, some of the standards uh, we'll have hopefully secured at moderator by that point, um, and then we can go from there from that. The other piece is that um, I, I would really hope that uh, for our presentation and Chris and I talking is that the intent is not to be the voice of either of our bodies, but to simply to be uh, the presenter of the budget that has been presented to us um, in the more um, larger aspect of the community. So it's not about a personal opinion and about things that we may or may not support, but things that um, need to be touched upon in certain trends and uh, type of analyses, you know, whether it's a per pupil cost ratio or if it's a mill rate comparison, whatever it might be. My goal is that I'd like to see um, both Chris and I's presentations to you in advance so that we could get feedback of, of uh, making sure that you're comfortable with what we're including and then also if we need to bring other pieces into it. And make for it. format as well. We're and, and we're trying to, to format we want to be balanced, understanding that our budgets are presented in very different formats because of state requirements, um, but we want to at least be consistent amongst our approach and how we do that as well. Yeah, I think just the, the tendency will be, I, I think the goal is to be good listeners and provide information, and, and I think the concern, not concern, but the thing to be aware of is that we don't dominate the conversation. Mm -hmm. that, Either the presentation ends up being 20 mm -hmm. minutes and mm -hmm. puts everyone to sleep, no offense. <laughs> if it was me, I'd be concerned with that. Yeah. Uh, or our answers are so deep and dense that uh, they get sidetracked and it's not a productive yeah. session. So keeping us all kind of honest and on track, I think is going to be real important. So we're going to be speaking with you to help us craft those yeah, presentations sure. Understood. to keep that, because we talked about the exact same thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very easy to get that really caught down in the weeds. So I, I mean, I, I, it sounds like the 29th is the date, though, which is the first is the is a that's uh, our present presentation, presentation, presentation of the that kicks off. The whole Sorry, time. I was looking at yeah. just the green. So the 29th, if it's fixed, then the next question becomes, um, what do we, what should we be doing as the bodies or as the town structure here to get the word out? How do we want to approach that? Well, I think we need to know some of the format particulars in yep. terms of how we're going to receive our information, how it's going to flow, and then we can start to publicize it. Okay. 
So uh, we have some work to do, I think, with uh, these two gentlemen. The other piece I had is that, because uh, we had talked about having maybe two public hearings or two town halls, and there's only one here. Mm -hmm. Are we going to limit it to just one? I don't know if the schedule will allow for a second. Mm -hmm. well, we do mm -hmm. have an opportunity. Two. Maybe two different parts of town. Mm -hmm. Oh. When, the, we, when we've done this in the past, or at least on the, like when we did the comprehensive plan years ago or growth management, we had like one in Dunstan area and then one on this side of town. Uh, to the extent that you want these televised, we do have pretty severe limitations as to yeah. what venue you can use and, and make sure, of course, it's... I'm okay with one, believe me. <laughs> I just want to make sure everybody else is too. Well, I mean, there yeah. yeah. would be public comment um, on 513 at the yep. Joint Town Council and School Board meeting. Okay. Well, it's the final joint workshop, right? Yeah. I mean, when this was done before in the past, and I realized I'm like one of the few people here who remembers yeah. it, it wasn't a fill, uh, filled auditorium, I can tell you that. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, and, and it was okay. done each year, so people should have known about it. It wasn't yeah. packed. It was just the people who yeah. really want to come out with somebody who's safe. Right, but I, again, I, I think from our, from the board's perspective, you know, we, we we, this is one of the only opportunities that the public may have to have comment on our budget, because usually we only get the, the, that time before the council's uh, uh, validation process. So if we're using this in lieu of that, I think it's important for us to, to make sure that the, the parents and the, and the uh, citizens that want to make those comments have that opportunity there if they're thinking it's going to be some other time. I'm not saying that that's the goal of it here, but if we get through this process and they're like, it's always the second, you know, when they do the second reading, that's when I get my chance to speak. You know, we had that two weeks ago, sorry, where I, I, I want to make sure no, we communicate that. That's never been a concern because we've never had a public hearing and second reading on the same night. We always okay. separate the two by at least two weeks, so there's, there's an opportunity. Um, okay. But I have to, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't want to take a huge step back, but I think it's worth it just to make sure that we're all on the same page, really to reiterate the goal that we're trying to achieve by this session. You know, hmm. Peter alluded to, what I think he was referring to the community dialogue right. format, which is really designed for a very in-depth, give and take, exchange, conversational exchange of, of hmm. as much detail as people can bear. Right. Right. It's really right. driven, the agenda is driven by the, the interest at the table. Hmm. But that's very much focused. That's not for a larger audience, that's you kind of gravitate to the area of your interest. Right. Um, Which serves a purpose, uh, yeah, but not to be not this purpose. Yeah. That's not what we're doing here. Right? As opposed yeah. to um, an opportunity for folks to address their legislative body, to tell them what's on their mind, how they should vote. And I suspect um, we're trying to serve both those purposes, mm -hmm. and that's, that's going to be proved to be challenging, I think. Mm -hmm. I think so. I think this is some, an opportunity for people who usually just come up and they want to say right. something that they have a question or they make a comment and we know that the information that they just said is not true. what is true or accurate, right. that everybody's been given an opportunity then, Sean or whoever, to say, well, you know, that's really not the case. The, the truth of that matter is that and just kind of get I think that. I can predict a question. Why do we need one-to-one at high school? Mm -hmm. yeah. well, wow. Who's going to feel that one and how are you going to do it in the succinct kind of oh, way? Oh, that one shows Tom. We'll have one pager. We'll have one pager already yeah. printed. Yeah, well, but, right. so so but I think. Yeah, I mean, I think that <coughs> things, we we talked about similar things. Is you know how, how who as the questions come in, does the does the moderator address the questions to you two, and then you decide the best person to answer, or or do we have a, the moderator ahead of time? I say if you know it's finance or something. You know, we I think we can work that in the structure a little bit to try and give it a little bit of uh, form. Right. Um, but I, 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 I have I kind of the other cons an opposite concern of, of people just getting up and wanting to keep that dialogue going and, and, and not you know wanting to get really down into the weeds of things. And at what point do we say you know you know we can get that information to you offline or you know how much time do we devote when when is the right time to say you know we we we've, we've got some we got kind of this is the top level stuff more detailed stuff we can take it offline or post it, whatever. You know, uh, kind of have those kind of rules of engagement. If yeah, you and them. certainly the, the skill of your moderator right. is pretty yeah. good. Exactly. You back it off that with structure, and then you're, yeah. you need to be nimble and go and, and, and follow. And what I'm hoping for with, uh, you know, Jessica Holbrook's engagement in this as well as Ms. Bealey is that things that are more, um, the word, uh, 
I don't want to say eclectic. Um, policy focused. Yeah, policy focused. Um, and as a statement on behalf of a decision that was made for each governing body, should be the chairwomen um, that represent us. And they can be the ones. I mean, Dr. Andrew Whistle can talk about why it's important for staff and the, uh, the you know, to your question, the staff and the environment. And Donna can talk about why the school board is supporting it. Well, and, and I think, like you said, Tom, we can, we can probably anticipate even right now right. what <laughs> some of these questions are going to be. Right. And that may be that that's what's a part of that introductory yeah. piece. Well, that that way, the PR. you should remove yeah. it. You part know? of the PR is to say, if you really want substantive answers, ideally you help give us a hint of what you're interested in yeah. so exactly. we can be prepared. Right. Um, and, and I like the idea, someone mentioned earlier about the um, solicit input in, the, uh, in advance maybe having an opportunity, because one of the things that we had talked about is that I know that uh, Chief Thurlow has had a community piece in the paper. Maybe we can talk to our friends in the paper yes, about sir. having um, a community piece by us on behalf of as chairs of the committee, but then also that's where we advertise. Here's the, the date, the time, the place, uh, and the process and the sources that they can go to to get information in advance so yes, we can be ready. And I think to, to, to your point, Tom, is once we get the infrastructure in place and we've got the date, once the infrastructure is, we can talk about the best way to get our PO. We've got um, uh, the school board has some email lists sure. that, that we could utilize for information output, that kind of stuff. And then I'll just mention I, I have talked with Kevin Friedman, who's both interested and sure. in available on that date, okay. and uh, I think he's got the sort of knowledge of the community and mm -hmm. certainly the facilitation skills to navigate. Mm -hmm. um, so if the four of us can get together in short order and start to flush out some of those details, we can then just going to check it out. You and I can collaborate on a date and we'll share it out with these okay. two. That works. Tell me when and where. That works. I'll open my schedule. I'd like to do <coughs> by this week. Sooner rather than later. End of this week or yeah, early, early next week, the latest. Do we have a meeting scheduled for March? So that's the, um, that's the last piece. Oh, uh, and you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> good segue. Good, good transition. Yes. Okay. So this is just the results of the doodle, last doodle poll I posed. Doodle. I love doodle. We've got to come up with a better name. Well, now that oh, may have changed. the last doodle poll? Yeah. Well, that may have, you know, <laughs> schedules may have changed when we said this. Yeah. <laughs> Our neighbor has a dog named Doodle. So just looking forward, oh, right. this, uh, you know, we tried to capture some dates into March, <coughs> and we did. So perhaps we can identify a date or two. It may make more sense to have a conversation around what are future topics uh, mm -hmm. that may dictate whether you need to meet once or twice, or, or if at all. Yep. So given the uh, time that we have, we have really four, I think we're eight eight weeks five. before the presentation. I'm sorry? I think March 5th for Tom and I are now take one to three or something. I think I think I got Nothing's more important than this mm -hmm. roof. Interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, no pressure. Huh? Yeah. So um, it looks like March 5th would be difficult anyways because we would be missing both uh, uh, Donna and Chris. Well, no, my, I, I'm tentative for March because I don't know my travel plans typically that okay. far in advance. So. Um, if we lock a date in for March, um, I, right now I can, I can, I'm, I'm far enough into it where I can, I can box it out of that. Okay. So um, I, I'd rather not do the fifth because we have a school. That's our regular school board meeting day at six seven. And Ruth just reminds me we have days of interviews with assessors. But so the fifth is out. Yeah. Um, and so um, obviously the 26th is out, giving it this Thursday. And we need some time in between. So that leaves us, at least on this schedule here, the 3rd, the 12th, 24th, and 26th. Um, given everyone's schedule, would it be easier if we reissue um, this along with some additional dates? You're going to make Tom do this. Get Tom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, April? 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 You mean April? Yeah, collect us. Collect us this? You mean the dates in April? Is that no, what you're thinking? No, March. Because we, oh, okay. we really need to, um, I would suggest, meet twice in March. So we can have everything finalized by April, or so that um, um, uh, the third. I, I'm, I'm available the third, the twelfth, the twenty-fourth. Um, can we pick the twenty-fourth as one of them and try to yep. get one before then? Yes. Yep. If um, we can do that, we can do the twenty-fourth, and then and the if we can do something this week, it would, I'd be able to be here. But anywhere in between, I won't. 
I'll be surprised if we can But that's okay. You can I mean, you're yeah. capable people. You don't have to have me sitting there. Yeah. But, um, so it looks like it's, uh, is it the 130 slot for the 24? That would be better for me. Uh, I'm sorry, which day? Uh, March 24th. Okay, 130? Yeah. yeah. Uh, whatever I've got, I'll try and, I'll try and move it. Okay. <coughs> and then I'll and then um, circulate other dates for then, so we try to grab a second. What about, what about the fifth again? Um, so is the fifth that, or the third? Well, the, oh, the, the fifth. fifth has a lot of, um, looks like there's a lot of people who are available. That's the one that Tom and Ruth just had to. Right, and oh, we oh, also oh, have school board, that's our business meeting date. Is that a problem? I don't know. As long as it, it goes right from here into we have to a long session, we have a final meeting, we have everything else to do with it. All right. Yeah, All right, the 12th. The, the, 12, the 12th. And you know how Katie likes to talk. 12th is good for me. Billy, you're on there as a... I, uh, I don't know what the conflict is, but I can see if I can move it. Okay. Yes, the 24th at 1.30. Yep. And now we've brought up the 12th. That's pretty good spacing. Um, it's a couple of weeks yeah, in between. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. What time is best on the 12th, uh, 1.30 or 3.30? Either one for me. Staff? The 12th of March. 1.30 either is fine for us, I think. March 12th. Did I say the 1.30? 1.30. All right, let's just pick 1.30. Let me put those two down. And yep. So 1.30, both the 12th and the 24th. And agenda we'll items, I know, will be school cost drivers. Yep. Carry it over. We'll have, we hopefully we'll have we'll something for up for our mm -hmm. report on the uh, town hall staff. Yeah. yeah, great. Yeah. That's going to be a big piece because we should have a way, maybe even a rough draft. So let's go with just Please those two. That should okay. be sufficient. Mm -hmm. I think so. Sounds good. Okay, great. Thank you. Tom, are you going to send uh, just uh, invitations out to this, or do we, or does this constitute the invitations? Put it in your calendar. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I, well, I'm just asking. <laughs> no, let's, uh, let's, let's send a or I'll I'll send I, I, okay. mm -hmm. uh, So just for the record, it's about 5, 10 p.m., so um, we're going to go ahead and adjourn. I do want to thank everyone, and you can thank uh, Mr. Creech as, as well as Ms. Lim for <laughs> coming, and I do appreciate them. Um, He's very self um, Especially Mr. Yeah. Creech getting away yeah. from yeah. the school Given so. what's happened. But thank you, everyone. Years thank you. Learning and right. mm -hmm. every adult.